Welcome, dear friends, to part two of part 14 of Exploring the Advent of Divine Justice. And tonight, dear friends, we will also start part 15. So without any further ado, we'll have our opening prayer. Thank you. O oh, my Lord, my defender, my help in peril, lowly do I entreat thee, ailing do I come to unto thee to be healed. Humbly do I cry out to thee with my tongue, my soul, my spirit. O oh God, my God, the gloom of night hath shrouded every religion, and all the earth is shut away behind thick clouds. The peoples of the world are sunk in the black depths of vain illusions, while their tyrants wallow in cruelty and hate. I see nothing but the glare of searing fires that blaze upward from the nethermost abyss. I hear nothing save the thunderous roar that bellows out for thousands upon thousands of fiery weapons of assault, while every land is crying out aloud in its sick, secret tongue, my riches avail me nothing, and my sovereignty hath perished. O oh, my Lord, the lamps of guidance have gone out, the flames of passion are mounting high, and malevolence, malevolence is ever gaining on the world. Malice and hate have overstepped the faith of the whole earth, and I find no soul except thine own oppressed small bland who are rising up this cry make haste to love make haste to trust mayst hate make haste to give to guidance come come ye for harmony to behold the day star come here for kindliness for ease come here for amity and peace come and cast down your weapons of wrath till unity is one Come, and in the Lord's true path, each one help one. Verily, with exceeding joy, with heart and soul, do these oppressed of thine offer themselves up for all mankind in every land. Thou seest them, O my Lord, weeping over the tears thy people have shed, mourning the grief of thy children, condoling with humankind, suffering because of the calamities that beset all the denizens of the world. O oh, my Lord, wing them with victory that they may soar upward to salvation. Strengthen their loins in service to thy people, and their backs in servitude to thy threshold of holiness. Verily thou art the generous, verily thou art the merciful. There is no God save thee, the clement, the pitiful, the ancient of days. Excellent. Thank you, Miss Claudia. So welcome, dear friends. This is our part three of our part 14. So tonight we will be covering paragraph 52. And paragraph 52 is found in this one on page 52, interestingly. So it's paragraph 52 is on page 52. Okay. And it starts, let them call to mind. Okay. And in this one, if you have this copy, it's found on page, let's, it says on page 29. Okay. So on page 29 here. Okay. So I'm going to uh, have my friend, Miss Jenny, will be reading uh, the paragraph uh, 52. So let me share my screen. Oh, I just opened it. I didn't mean I haven't not shared it. There, share and share. Okay, there we go. So, Miss Jenny, you have the floor. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Let them call to mind, fearlessly and determinedly, the example and the conduct of Abdu'l-Baha while in their midst. Let them remember his courage, his genuine love, his informal and indiscriminating fellowship, his contempt for 
and impatience of criticism, tempered by his tact and wisdom. Let them revive and perpetuate the memory of those unforgettable and historic episodes and occasions on which he so strikingly demonstrated his keen sense of justice, his spontaneous sympathy for the downtrodden, his ever abiding sense of the oneness of the human race, his overflowing love for its members, and his displeasure with those who dared to flout his wishes, to deride his methods, to challenge his principles, or to nullify his acts. Beautifully read, Miss Jenny. Thank you. So this is such an important paragraph, dear friends. Paragraph 52. Why? Because the beloved guardian says, always call to mind the example of Abdul Baha. And this is the example of Abdul Baha right after paragraph 51. And what was paragraph 51? Very powerful paragraph as to racial prejudice, the corrosion of which, for well, for a nigh a century, have attacked the whole structure of the American society, right? Whereas calling out this racism as the most vital and challenging issue, right? Now, he, the first thing the beloved guardian does, he puts the example of Abdul Baha in front of our eyes. And he says, let us look to how Abdul Baha, remember Abdul Baha crossed this great America 239 days. And do you think he saw racism in America at that point in time? Of course he did, right? And how did he confront it? With his example, his words, his deeds. So this is now the beloved guardian saying, let them call to mind his example. How did he do it? So this is something that we should study, dear friends. Study the example of how Abdul Baha did. And if we mirror forth his example, we always use this beautiful, look at me, follow me, right? We always sing this beautiful, but do we look to his example, right? In how he handled these subjects. Often we mirror the example of society, you know, how they do things. But to specific things such as racism, we should also look, how did Abdul Baha handle these subjects? Because Abdul Baha was right there in the heat of it too. So let them remember his courage. So. We should be courageous, right? But his genuine love, genuine love, informal and indiscriminating fellowship, his contempt for and impatience of criticism, tempered by his tact and wisdom. Tact and wisdom, dear friends. We should be used these. Let them revive and perpetuate the memory of those unforgettable and historic episodes. So we should be knowledgeable, dear friends. Read, 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 read those historic episodes and occasions on which he, what? So strikingly demonstrated his keen sense of justice, spontaneous sympathy for the downtrodden, his ever abiding sense of the oneness of the human race. And I love this, dear friends, his overflowing love for its members. And his displeasure with those who dare to flout his wishes, to deride his methods, to challenge his principles, or to nullify his acts. There is so many examples on this, dear friends. But I'm just going to share just a few. But I want you to, this as just, there's a billion and one examples on race and racism, right? On that past section. But, and there's so many on also the example of Abdul Baha. So I'm just going to share with a few, not to um, go too much into it, because there's just so much. So let us go uh, into this, dear friends. Uh, the model of Abdul Baha. In dealing with racial prejudice, the beloved guardian counsels the North American Baha'is in paragraph 52 to remember the example and conduct of Abdul Baha when he visited them. In particular, his courage, his genuine love, his informal and indiscriminating fellowship, his contempt for 
and impatience of criticism, tempered by his tact and wisdom. He then asked the Baha'is to revive and perpetuate the events in which he demonstrated. So these are the things in which he demonstrated. His keen sense of justice, spontaneous sympathy for the downtrodden, his sense of the oneness of the human race, his overflowing love for its members, and his displeasure for those who dare to flout his wishes, deride his methods, challenge his principles, or to nullify his acts. And here's an extract from this recent message, dear friends, from the Universal House of Justice, July 22nd, 2020. And to my dear class, I urge each one of you to study this great pivotal document. So go get it. It's online, July 22nd, 2020 message. Okay. From, th from this extract, it says, Ahead of you lie times of trial and promise, of hardship and progress, of anguish and joy. Under all conditions, this is from the Supreme uh, House of Justice, it says, under all conditions, the master is your solace and support for those who aspire to lasting change. His example guides the way tactful and wise in his approach, penetrating in utterance, indiscriminating in fellowship, unfailing in sympathy for the downtrodden, courageous in conduct, persevering in action, imperturbable in the face of tests, unwavering in his keen sense of justice. And to all who arise to emulate him, he offers this unfailing assurance. That which is confirmed is the oneness of the world of humanity. Every soul who serveth this oneness will undoubtedly be assisted and confirmed. So these are the qualities of Abdul Baha. These are the qualities, dear friends. When we call ourselves a Baha'i, what are we striving to be? We are trying to follow this example, and we should be striving towards courage. We should be striving towards perseverance and having an unwavering, keen sense of justice. And in our approach, we should be tactful and wise and having this true sense of love, genuine love. And something that I said in a, in a prior session, when I said, what does it mean to be a Baha'i? It means to be a promoter of the oneness of humanity, an active promoter of the oneness of humanity. Dear Tesfai, you unmuted yourself, please. Yeah, you know what is, um, when you come to the wisdoms of the writings of Baha'u'llah, it reminds me that is to be the source of courage and power is a promotion of the word of God and the steadfastness in his lap. That's what he says. So what the courage means, it's not an easy thing to be Baha'i and to promote also the word of God and the steadfastness. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's not an easy thing. So uh, go ahead, I just want to come. It is an interesting question, dear Tesfaye. The more you fall in love, the more you lose yourself. You know, is uh, I the easiest example I could give is when you fall in love with a whether you're a lady you fall in love with a man or you're men falling in love with a lady. The more you fall in love, you often do things that are irrational and things that you would never think to ever do. And you would you say that is courageous? <laughs> would you or you would you? And it's because your heart burns, right? You would just do them because you're in love. That is, I think, is a selfless stage. Right? When, when we are in selfless stage, but we are the Baha'is, we are not reached that level, I think, because of our maturity level is not yet reached that stage. 
we are still struggling and promoting day by day to be better and better. We often, as an example, use these generalizations, my dear friend Tesfaye, the Baha'is, you know? We group ourselves into big, you know, groups. We should focus on ourselves. And that is it. How am I progressing? This is the most important. The Baha'i faith came to Tesfai. The Baha'i faith came to my dear friend David, to Miss Kathy, to Miss Darla. His Holiness Baha'u'llah sacrificed himself for each one of you. Now, how are we, myself included, how are we following the example? Right? So, it, to make this generalization, the Baha'is are not, you know, this or that, that's irrelevant. But how, what are we doing, you know, for the transformation so that we can affect a change in the humanity? This is the most important thing. So, dear friends, we progress, we carry on. So this is the example of Abdul Baha. And it's so amazing. What I love is this. Now here, the... Beloved Guardian is placing this right after that pivotal paragraph 51. So he's now saying, this is the example of Abdul Baha, how to confront racism directly. So we now want to share with you this example of this Lewis Gregory and the transformative, what did Abdul Baha do to the Lewis Gregory? So this is so amazing. And this is the example of Abdul Baha. So in 1911, His Holiness Abdul Baha invited a well-known African-American Baha'i, Louis Gregory, to visit him. And during the visit, Abdul Baha stressed to Louis Gregory the significance of race unity and of bringing together white and black Americans. Louis Gregory traveled to Egypt where Abdul Baha was staying at the time. He then visited the Baha'i holy places in Palestine. And Gregory recalls, Abdul Baha said many wonderful things during my brief contact with him in Egypt, which lasted less than a fortnight. But more than anything else, his discourse was about the American race problem. After the pilgrimage, Abdul Baha continued to urge Gregory to work for unity and harmony between the races. So this was an incredible pilgrimage that Louis Gregory encountered. So he was the second African American to go on pilgrimage. Does anyone remember the first one? Yes, Miss Kathy. Robert Turner. Robert Turner. Excellent, Robert Turner. And does anyone know his title? Butler. Miss Yuda, do you know his title? Well, he was butler to Phoebe Hurst. That's true. That's true. He was the butler to Miss Phoebe Hurst. But when I use title, he had a, just like we say, hand of the cause of God. You know, he has a title in this faith. His, his title is Disciple of Abdul Baha. And as dear friends, we should know these titles because just like we say, hand of the cause of God, Mr. Ali Akbar Frutan, this is a disciple of Abdul Baha. And this individual, Mr. Robert Turner, for the entire faith of God, we will, we will study his life as more and more great scholars and historians will study his life. And we will learn that he will be the gate to bring in the entire African-American race to this faith because of his purity and his love. So this is an incredible thing. And same as our dear friend, Mr. Lewis Gregory, hand of the cause of God. So these souls will be studied for the entire faith the history of the faith. So let us go into um, who these souls are. His Holiness Abdul Baha deplored the racial segregation prevalent in the United States and strongly urged the friends to associate with each other in the utmost joy and happiness. 
He called for such a gathering and it took place Wednesday, April 17th at the home of Mr. and Mrs. Kinney, where Baha'is and their friends of both the black and white races met in unity. He prepared and served the meal himself, speaking of the human family as a garden of flowers of various hues. The master was most happy and the spirit of the friends was high. It was felt that this was a landmark in the city. This memorable event was followed by a public address at the hotel. Dear friends, I, I bring this history of the encounter of Abdul Baha so that you, dear friends, get inspired to go read these accounts. Abdul Baha arrived in Montclair, New Jersey. And this is so amazing. On Friday, June 20th, 21st, 1912, staying in a house he had rented in advance. Most of his time was occupied in talking with the people who came to see him. On Sunday morning, June 23rd, Abdul Baha told the Baha'is more of the history of the faith. As he came into the living room where the people were gathered, he said to one of the incoming friends, you are always smiling. Mr. Frank E. Osborne replied, surely our faces should reflect happiness in this presence. Abdul Baha replied, yes, this is the day of Baha'u'llah, the age of the blessed perfection, the cycle of the greatest name. If you do not smile now, for what time will you await? And what greater happiness could you expect? So this is Abdul Baha in America and in New York. And obviously surrounded by suffering, surrounded by the friends in segregation, surrounded, but he's calling for the friends, the Americans to radiate happiness, for the friends to come together, right? So this is his example that he's calling for. And do you think someone coming straight out of prison, go, barely speaking English, and going forth and saying, these races should come together and sit in this meeting together and have a picnic together like, that, like he did? He would have been, not to be crude, but strung from a tree. He would have, you know, truly. He, but he had audacity. He had courage. And dear friends, we do are not have all these limitations around us, you know, like past times. But we should have that level of courage to speak forth of the oneness of humanity, our love for African Americans. We should be have that level of courage as Abdul Baha had. So this is a, a, in Montclair. This is very beautiful. And this is his in encounter. So I shared, I, I'm sharing this episode that happened in New York, the city of the covenant. So Abdul Baha left Montclair at 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, June 29th. And after transferring four different streetcars, arrived at Roy Wilhelm's house in West Englewood, New Jersey. This was the large outdoor gathering the unity feast to which Abdul Baha had invited the friends before he left New York. Addressing this entire group, he said, this is a new day and this hour is a new hour in which we have come together. True Baha'i meetings are the mirrors of the kingdom wherein images of the supreme concourse are reflected. First, you must become united and agreed among yourself. When he had finished, the meal was ready, but just as it was announced, thunder was heard and a large raindrops began to fall. Abdul Baha walked to the road, taking a chair, and several friends grouped around him. As he sat, his face turned upward. A strong wind began to blow, the clouds began to disperse, and the sun shone through then he rose and walked back into the grove. 
After the meal of Persian food, Abdul Baha anointed the 250 guests with attar of roses. After dark, as the friends sat down on the lawn with candles, Abdul Baha spoke, ending as he walked into the darkness. Peace be with you. I will pray for you. On the glorious day set aside for this unique gathering, friends, neighbors and strangers from the east, west, north and south, rich and poor, white and black, all one in the spirit, truly a marvelous de demonstration. Some of the people present that day included, here are the names, dear friends, Bertha Clark, Mary Ford, Sylvia Gannett, Maud Gadu, Lua Getzinger, Mrs. Gertrude Harris, Mr. Hooper Harris, Bertha Herklotz, Ali Cooley Khan, Florence Khan, Mr. and Mrs. Edward Kinney, Florine Krog, Marjorie Morton, Grace Ober, Grace Robarts, Martha Root, Charlotte Segler, Erwin Smith, Juliet Thompson, Neville Thompson, Thomas, Amalia Tyler, Roy Wilhelm, and his mother, and many more, too numerous to mention. About 450 persons were gathered. What a gathering, what a gathering. And here, dear friends, is a picture of this unity feast, 1912. So this was a demonstration of the master's love and the unity he wanted to bring about, bringing about to people from the north, to the south, east, west, black, white, regardless, his outpouring of love, his example that he was pouring out to everybody. Hey, Isan, is this is the formative age? This was the, yes, yes. This is the for, this is uh, this is in the heroic age because the form, heroic, okay, heroic, is, yeah. That's right, because the formative age um, starts from the passing. Of the beloved guardians uh, says more applicably from the passing of the uh, Abdul Baha's sister, Khanum. But in um, so this is uh, the passing of Abdul Baha was in 1921. But this is still the heroic age. Okay, so racial prejudice was in its heyday in the Washington of 1912. Even the Washington DC Baha'i community of that day was not immune to its deadly virus. His Holiness Abdul Baha openly challenged the status quo in words and deeds. Speaking at Howard University, an all black institution, he said, if the heart is pure, white or black, or any color makes no difference, God does not look at color, he looks at the hearts. So he immediately challenged it, his courage. And here, dear friends, is an ex, this is, was from the publication, Baha'i Leader at Howard University, head of Oriental Religious Sect, delivers lecture to the student body. So let us have a reader, let's continue on this uh, little extract on history. Dear David, you're up, go for it. Today, the master went to Howard University, an educational institution for blacks. The host, mostly black with a few whites, had made special arrangements so that when the master arrived, he was welcomed with mu by music from the band while the audience applauded with excitement and exuberance. It, was, it is difficult to describe the scene adequately the president of the university was very cordial, entered, introduced Abdul Baha as the prophet of peace and the harbinger of unity and salvation. Then the master rose from his seat and spoke on the subject of the harmony between blacks and whites and the unity of humankind. The audience repeatedly applauded him during the talk, delighted at his words. At the conclusion, the president of the university thanked Abdul Baha on behalf of all those gathered. As he left, as he left the auditorium, group after group formed two lines, one on each side, 
all showing their highest respect by bowing and waving their hats and handkerchiefs in farewell to the beloved master. So this is um, a very significant talk and dear friends, this is in promulgation of universal peace that we can find this talk and urge you dear friends, not only to study the talks of Abdul Baha, but the example of Abdul Baha in giving talks on this subject. This is one of the first things he did. So if we're to follow his example, we should be giving talks on the oneness of humanity the harmony between blacks and whites, the harmony that there is only one race, there is only uh, the hum one race in the sense of one humanity. So our love should be pouring out just as Abdul Baha was. So here, this is in, this is an actual picture. This is the students gathering near Minor Hall at Howard University. So this is a picture right there. This is the gathering. And this is the building where it was held. And this is the president, Wilbur P. Thur I guess Thurkeld. This is the president at Howard University, and he was the gentleman that introduced Abdul Baha on the April 23rd, 1912. What an honor, you know, to be not only to be in his presence, but to introduce Abdul Baha. So Let's carry on on this little extract in history on this uh, incredible episode. So our next reader is going to be Miss Darla. You're up, Miss Darla. Go for it. Tuesday, April 23rd. On Tuesday, after seeing several people in the morning, Abdul Baha and Dr. Farid went for a short drive, stopped at Mr. and Mrs. Hannon's, and afterward they went to Howard University, where Abdul Baha made an address before a large audience of professors and students. He dwelt largely upon the need of love and unity between the white and black races, and spoke of the gratitude which the colored people should feel for the whites, because through them came not only freedom for their race, but it was the beginning of freedom for all slaves. He also told through education, the differences between the two races would be lessened. Excellent, thank you. Miss Deborah, could you read this one? On Tuesday, April 23rd at noon, Abdul Baha addressed the student body of more than 1,000, the faculty and a large number of distinguished guests at Howard University. This was a most notable occasion, and here, as everywhere, when both white and colored people were present, Abdul Baha seemed happiest. The address was received with breathless attention by the vast audience and was followed by a positive ovation and a recall. That evening, the Bethel Literary and Historical Society, the leading colored organization in Washington was addressed. And again, the audience taxed the capacity of the edifice in which the meeting was held. So why have Agnes Parsons in, the back, in these two extracts? This is from Agnes Parsons' diary. And it's Abdul Baha in American in America, this is part of Agnes Parsons' diary. So this is her diary notes of that episode. And so, Asan, yes, I would like to. I'd like to make a, a comment that, please, that please. these talks are being done during Rizvan. Excellent. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That would that would be wonderful to hear. That's right. This is the time period, April 23rd. And I'm sure that um, uh, that's what, this is the time period that it was happening. So here is Abdul Baha in Washington. This is the actual his, historical newspaper extract. You can see this is Baha'i leader at Howard University, head of Oriental religious sect, delivers a lecture to the student body. And it says, Washington, the effect of freedom in this country re reacted all over the world. 
It says, Washington, April 25th, Abdul Baha'i Abbas Effendi, Oriental seer and world leader of the Baha'i movement, delivered the last of his series of lectures here tonight. In an address to the students of Howard University, he said, let us recall the fact that the first proclamation of liberty of freedom from slavery was accomplished in this continent. The white man went into war for the sake of the colored. They were forfeiting possessions and sacrificing lives in order that the colored might be freed from bondage. And this has had tremendous effects upon the sociology of other parts. The colored people of Africa were in a most terrible state of bondage and the European powers emulating the American altruism accomplished a proclamation of universal liberty. So dear friends, this is extracts also from Promulgation of Universal Peace. So you can go to it. I just, um, you can see the full letter there. But this is an, uh, from uh, the newspaper account. So moving on, dear friends, this is, we're going to explore more on this Lewis Gregory. What an individual. And I urge you to study this gentleman. What an incredible, incredible light he was. At an all-whites luncheon, where many of the glitterati of Washington society were present, Abdul Baha suddenly stood up, looked all around, and said to his host, where is Mr. Gregory? Bring Mr. Gregory. The host rushed to get Lewis Gregory, who was no doubt thought to be one of the blacks serving those present at, at the table. Mr. Gregory was brought to the head of the table and seated in the place of honor at Abdul Baha's right. In Washington, his Holiness Abdul Baha asserted that harmony between the black and white races would be an assurance of world peace. This is my last slide, and I, I wanted just to focus on this example of bringing Lewis Gregory at that point, 1912, not only to the table, but to the seat of honor. This, this is the very powerful slide. It says diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice and belonging is having that voice be heard. So in one, one movement, Abdul Baha did all of that by bringing Lewis Gregory to the table, by not only showing that demonstration of diversity, by including him and giving him that sense of belonging. One movement and his genuine love, his courage. You see this? So this was just one movement of Abdul Baha. So that was an incredible um, picture that I just wanted to share on um, on uh, Lewis Gregory, on the example of Abdul Baha. So that will conclude part 14. We're now moving to part 15, unless you have any questions. I hope you enjoyed that section. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. Please, dear testify. Uh, what I observed here is, you know, what you read all tonight is today is to be when Abdul Baha is talking about the race. He never used the word uh, Negro like uh, the guardian, but he says all the time, black and white. And why is that he didn't mention like that? Is it to be the guardian saying, the, using the word Negro is to be more specified or what's the reason? Great question, dear Tesfai. The Universal House of Justice uh, actually wrote, uh, has a letter on this and the beloved guardian used the terminology that was current at the time. So the words that the beloved guardian used in this day and age, people, the friends may look, no, that's not appropriate, that's not right. But the beloved guardian used the words that were applicable at the time so that the friends could hear the words that were voiced. Uh, so, because if the beloved guardian used the words African-Americans or 
you know, this, they were not even considered Americans at that point in 1912. They hadn't received rights. They were still in, in many places, still mentally considered in bondage. It was just 1912 and, at that point. And they were still considered servants in most areas, but to be called African-Americans would be an overreach. So do you see? He, that is why the beloved guardian used the term that the Americans could understand. Understand? So um, the House of Justice, there's a letter on it, and I can uh, share that with the friends uh, on that. Uh, actually, my dear friend, uh, Dennis McGregor, I believe, sent that uh, to me. So um, on that. Okay, so let us move on, dear friends. Now we're going to get into this section. And again, urge you to read and reread these sections because paragraph 52, example of how Abdul Baha approached the issue of racism. Now we're getting into these very powerful paragraphs, 53 through 58. How does the beloved guardian now say we should approach racism as a whole? So this is a uh, very may important. May I ask a question? Of course, dear Amir, please. So in, in two of the, the last slides, you, you mentioned that Abdul Baha was kind of praising the, the civil war in the, in the United States as a, a means to, to, um, to end slavery in the States. So the question is, uh, I was un under the impression that Baha'is are kind of un against uh, war and aggression as, as a means to issues. So how, how, how can you praise uh, and, and say that to, to the black to, to, to thank the white for, for going into war to, to get the black uh, out of slavery? Ah, I understand you. Uh, so where Abdul Baha is saying that the the blacks should be appreciative to the whites, um, is that your your question, dear Amir? Why they should be appreciative? Is that why your question? Yeah, it's it, it's both that and just the the, the fact that 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 um, it was a, a, a sounds like a good thing to do to go into war to. Uh, to achieve that goal, gotcha. is that which somewhat con contradict with the, the idea of um, you know army war are not the means to resolve issue, even if they are very important. Excellent, excellent point. Okay, so this is something, dear friends, is a great question. Thank you, Amir, for raising it. Great question. And I'm sure many of our dear friends here can answer far better than I can. So, I, first of all, I urge you to read the, the, that uh, talk in promulgation of universal peace for yourself. First, read it for yourself. Number two, His Holiness Abdul Baha, when he was um, explaining that the uh, Africans, Americans should be thankful uh, to the whites it's because when in his the letter it's in the talk he's saying that the africans in that point in time would have been continued under the yoke of slavery if it wasn't for the british taking up even though prior granted prior they were under slavery and the british were one of the major orchestrators of slavery as well as you know, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and all of them. But at that point in time, the British were the first to disband slavery. And they were the first to say slavery is abhorrent. And then when the British made that mandate, they fought tooth and nail to go and go fight to make sure that slavery is nowhere. That was really what and then they also brought education to their colonies. They brought, so this is something, another uh, thing that they did. So even though under the, the, 
the yoke of slavery in these areas such as Africa and other areas, the slaves, the enslaved peoples were suffering. But when they were freed, they started having access to these uh, privileges of education, privileges of um, a better life. And so he's saying, be thankful that the British freed you, brought you out of this yoke of slavery. Be thankful. Because God knows there were many other countries that were still not doing that. And so he's saying, be thankful for that. That's really where it's getting at, dear Amir, uh, where Abdul Baha is saying, be thankful. But uh, Dr. Bayat, and as well as Karen, uh, Dr. Bayat had his hand first, please. Yes, if I understood the, the question of Amir John, it's particularly referring to the fact that Abdul Baha says the whites went to war to free you. It could easily refer to the War of Independence in the United States, where the Nor Northern Republics, mostly white, fought against uh, the southern states to free uh, African Americans and end slavery. Although there were many other reasons for the cause, but this was clearly one of the reasons. So Abdul Baha basically is referring to the sacrifices that the whites did so that the blacks will be freed. He's not, he's not encouraging wars. He's just referring to the sacrifices that the white did in order to free the blacks in the uh, in United States. Uh, that's what I understood of that concept. Thank you. Excellent point, Dr. Bat. Thank you. Ms. Karen, please. Um, yes. Um, also in Promulgation of Universal Peace, there is a passage, and I'm trying to find the particular page. Um, but Abdu'l-Baha lays upon both black and white something that is difficult for each to do, especially when viewing the long range of history and current affairs. And the passage says this, I hope that you attain to such a high degree that, and this is impossible except through love, you must try to create love between yourselves and this love does not come about unless you are grateful to the whites. But he goes further. And the whites are loving toward you and endeavor to promote your advancement and enhance your honor. This will be the cause of love. Differences between black and white will be completely obliterated. Indeed, ethnic and national differences with all disappear. And it seems to, in reading that, what I take away, one of the things I take away is that each group of people is called upon to do that which is hardest right. as members of the same human race in order to create that love and unity. Um, without having that view, it comes very hard and may not accomplish. Um, so in, 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 in keeping with tonight's theme about following Abdu'l-Baha's example, it seems so pertinent now that we bring this ever more before all people that we have to strive to do that which is hardest for us. And through that, we build our unity. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. All right. Thank you, Amir, for that question. Yes, please. Just very quickly, context is everything. You know, and a, and a talk given at Howard University in 1912 is uh, so far away from what any of us could imagine a talk given at a university would be, quite simply, at a historic university. This is the age of the, the founding of the NAACP, the writings of W.E.B. Du Bose. He, you know, Du Bose is in that, in that uh, uh, philosophical and ideological pragmatic conflict uh, with Booker Washington. And, and he is, you know, Du Bose is calling for uh, uh, economic strides forward and in, in independent economic route. And, uh, and, and he, 
he he has an edge to him and i i think in the context of that and of the audience abdul baha is saying there's some mutuality engaged in here and i uh, yeah i think this uh, the, the surrounding of that time uh in in which wilson was bringing the south back into power in the nation's capital a very rigorous segregation in washington dc of all places was supplanting a, a a a real loosening that had occurred before under roosevelt and taft this was a different time in a different place and and her comment about context is the is the key excellent point thank you pat very well said and thank you uh, pat always happy to have you miss karen you have a hand yeah i just wanted to also agree with hoda that that's exactly right um when I remember first reading this, this particular phrase, I thought, oh my God, this is something I cannot say to my black friends and acquaintances, given the history in this country of the persecution and the problems they have gone through and continue to go through. Um, I come from a multiracial family and believe me, we went through our own set of problems and it's very hard to feel what Abdul Baha was talking about towards the people who are perpetrating things upon you that are so unjust. I think in terms of this particular statement, it helps us to understand our own actions and our own thoughts. Of course, I'm not going to march up to someone and say that particular thing, but it is going to inform my own actions. And right here is where we follow with tact and wisdom, Abdu'l-Baha's example. Um, uh, so that's my thought on that. Um, and yes, historical context has to be remembered as we go forward, learning about the history of racial persecution in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Karen. All right. Um, let us move to now the paragraphs 53 through 58. Thank you so much. Wonderful uh, questions and discussion on this end. Okay. Let us go here. Okay. Here we go. Let me check my time. Okay, got a good half an hour. Okay, so these are paragraphs 53 through 58. In these paragraphs, we're gonna be covering the Baha'i perspective on race, acknowledging human diversity, refuting what this biological concept of race is, positive discrimination in favor of minorities, as well as freedom from racial prejudice, as well as we'll just touch on progress on race unity. So these are just some of the themes that we'll be exploring. And this is a lot, one of the large uh, sections, so probably we'll take at least two sessions to cover this one. So, our first reader is Miss Karen. Okay, this is one of the greatest paragraphs, so go for it. To discriminate against any race on the ground of its being socially backward, politically immature, and numerically in a minority is a flagrant violation of the spirit that animates the faith of Baha'u'llah. The consciousness of any division or cleavage in its ranks is alien to its very purpose, principles, and ideals. Once its members have fully recognized the claim of its author and, by identifying themselves with its administrative order, accepted unreservedly the principles and laws embodied in its teachings, Every differentiation of class, creed, or color 
must automatically be obliterated and never be allowed under any pretext. And however great the pressure of events or of public opinion to reassert itself. If any discrimination is at all to be tolerated, it should be a discrimination not against, but rather in favor of the minority, be it racial or otherwise. Unlike the nations and peoples of the earth, be they of the East or of the West, democratic or authoritarian, communist or capitalist, whether belonging to the old world or the new, who either ignore, trample upon, or extirpate the racial, religious, or political minorities within the sphere of their jurisdiction, every organized community enlisted under the banner of Baha'u'llah should feel it to be its first and inescapable obligation to nurture, encourage, and safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. Beautiful, Red. Thank you, Ms. Karen. Keep going. It's a long paragraph. Okay. So great and vital is this principle that in such circumstances, as when an equal number of ballots have been cast in an election, or where the qualifications for any office are balanced as between the various races, faiths, or nationalities within the community, priority should unhesitatingly be accorded the party representing the minority. And this for no other reason except to stimulate and encourage it and afford it an opportunity to further the interests of the community. In the light of this principle and bearing in mind the extreme desirability of having the minority elements participate and share responsibility in the conduct of Baha'i activity, it should be the duty of every Baha'i community so to arrange its affairs that in cases where individuals belonging to the diverse minority elements within it are already qualified and fulfill the necessary requirements, Baha'i representative institutions, be they assemblies, conventions, conferences, or committees may have represented on them as many of these diverse elements racial or otherwise as possible. The adoption of such a course and faithful adherence to it would not only be a source of inspiration and encouragement to those elements that are numerically small and inadequately represented, but would demonstrate to the world at large the universality and representative character of the faith of Baha'u'llah and the freedom of his followers from the taint of, these pre of those prejudices which have already wrought such havoc in the domestic affairs as well as the foreign relationships of the nations. Thank you, Ms. Carey. Freedom from racial prejudice in any of its forms should, at such a time as this, when an increasingly large section of the human race is falling a victim to its devastating ferocity, be adopted as the watchword of the entire body of the American believers, in whichever state they reside, in whatever circles they move, whatever their age, traditions, tastes, and habits, it should be consistently demonstrated in every phase of their activity and life, whether in the Baha'i community or outside it, in public or in private, formally as well as informally, individually as well as in their official capacity as organized groups, committees, and assemblies. It should be deliberately cultivated 
through the various and everyday opportunities, no matter how insignificant that present themselves, whether in their homes, their business offices, their schools and colleges, their social parties and recreation grounds, their Baha'i meetings, conferences, conventions, summer schools and assemblies. It should, above all else, become the keynote of the policy of that august body, which in its capacity as the national representative and the director and coordinator of the affairs of the community must set the example and facilitate the application of such a vital principle to the lives and activities of those whose interests it safeguards and represents. Let us have another reader. Okay, Hodajan, could you read this one for us? O ye discerning ones, Baha'u'llah has written, Verily the words which have descended from the heaven of the will of God are the source of unity and harmony for the world. Close your eyes to racial differences and welcome all with the light of oneness. We desire but the good of the world and the happiness of the nations, he proclaims that all nations should become one in faith and all men as brothers, that the bonds of affection and unity between the sons of men should be strengthened, that the diversity of religion should cease and differences of race be annulled. Baha'u'llah hath said, writes Abdul Baha, that the various races of humankind lend a composite harmony and beauty of color to the whole. Let all associate, therefore, in this great human garden, even as flowers grow and blend together side by side without discord or disagreement between them. Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha moreover, has said, once compared the colored people to the black pupil of the eye, surrounded by the white. In this black pupil is seen the reflection of that which is before it, and through it the light of the spirit shineth forth. Thank you, Hodaja. Mary McGregor, can you read please? God, Abdu Baha himself declares, maketh no distinction between the white and the black. If the hearts are pure, both are acceptable unto him. God is no respecter of persons on account of either color or race. All colors are acceptable unto him, be they white, black, or yellow. Inasmuch as all were created in the image of God, we must bring ourselves to realize that all embody divine possibilities. In the estimation of God, he states, all men are equal. There is no distinction or preference for any soul in the realm of his justice and equity. God did not make these divisions. He affirms, these divisions have had their origin in man himself. Therefore, as they are against the plan and purpose of God, they are false and imaginary. In the estimation of God, he again affirms, there is no distinction of color. All are one in the color and beauty of servitude to him. Color is not important. The heart is all important. It mattereth not 
what the exterior may be if the heart is pure and white within. God doeth not behold differences of hue and complexion. He looketh at the hearts. Thank you, Mary. Very well, Ren. Thank you. Okay. He whose morals and virtues are praiseworthy is preferred in the presence of God. He who is devoted to the kingdom is most beloved. In the realm of Genesis and creation, the question of color is of least importance. Throughout the animal kingdom, he explains, we do not find the creatures separated because of color. They recognize unity of species and oneness of kind. If we do not find color distinction drawn in a kingdom of lower intelligence and reason, how can it be justified among human beings, especially when we know that all have come from the same source and belong to the same household? In origin and intention of creation, mankind is one. Distinctions of race and color have arisen afterward. Man is endowed with superior reasoning, power, and the faculty of perception. He further explains, he is the manifestation of divine bestowals. Shall racial ideas prevail and obscure the creative purpose of unity in his kingdom? One of the important questions, he significantly remarks which affect the unity and the solidarity of mankind is the fellowship and equality of the white and colored races. Between these two races, certain points of agreement and points of distinction exist, which warrant just and mutual consideration. The points of contact are many. In this country, the United States of America, patriotism is common to both races. All have equal rights to citizenship, speak one language, receive the blessings of the same civilization, and follow the precepts of the same religion. In fact, numerous points of partnership and agreement exist between the two races, whereas the one point of distinction is that of color. Shall this the least of all distinctions be allowed to separate you as races and individuals? This variety in forms and coloring, he stresses, which is manifest in all the kingdoms, is according to creative wisdom and hath a divine purpose. The diversity in the human family, he claims, should be the cause of love and harmony as it is in music, where many different notes blend together in the making of a perfect chord. If you meet, is his admonition, those of a different race and color from yourself, do not mistrust them and withdraw yourself into your shell of conventionality, but rather be glad and show them kindness. In the world of being, he testifies, the meeting is blessed when the white and colored races meet together with infinite spiritual love and heavenly harmony. When such meetings are established and the participants associate with each other with perfect love, unity, and kindness, the angels of the kingdom praise them, and the beauty of Baha'u'llah addresseth them. Blessed are ye, blessed are ye. When a gathering of these two races is brought about, he likewise asserts that assemblage will become the magnet of the concourse on high, and the confirmation of the blessed beauty will surround it. Strive earnestly. He again exhorts both races 
and put forth your greatest endeavor toward the accomplishment of this fellowship and the cementing of this bond of brotherhood between you. Such an attainment is not possible without will and effort on the part of each, from one expressions of gratitude and appreciation, from the other kindliness and recognition of equality. Each one should endeavor to develop and assist the other toward mutual advancement. Love and unity will be fostered between you, thereby bringing about the oneness of mankind for the accomplishment of unity between the colored and white will be an assurance of the world's peace. Don, could you read the next one? I hope he thus addresses members of the white race that you may cause that downtrodden race to become glorious and to be joined with the white race to serve the world of man with the utmost sincerity, faithfulness, love, and purity. This opposition, enmity, and prejudice among the white race and the colored cannot be effaced except through faith, assurance, and the teachings of the blessed beauty. This question of the union of the white and the black is very important, he warns. For if it is not realized, ere long great difficulties will arise and harmful results will follow. If this matter remaineth without change, is yet another warning. Amnity will be increased day by day, and the final result will be hardship and may end in bloodshed. Thank you, Don. Okay. You know, I have some quotes for you. Yes, Tesfaya? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I remember something that quotations come to my mind when we talk about race. In the 1923, you know, after the passing of Abdul Baha, Emperor Haile Selassie, uh, the Ethiopian emperor, when he joined to the love of nation, and he said that in the meeting, that if white people, they don't like black people, what you have to do is you have to take the black part of your eye from your eyes and you will see the difference. Mm -hmm. And then Mugabe from South Africa, he said that when you see a white man during the wedding time wearing the black suit with white shirt and then black shoes, how they look elegant and beautiful. Look at the beauty. And then he mentioned like that both these two leaders. So just, I just like to highlight the race things that you are mentioned here. Beautiful examples. Love it. Thank you very much, Tesfaye, for sure. And dear Tesfaye, you are our next reader. Please. Go. Oh. All right. A tremendous effort is required. Can you hear me? Yes, of course. Thank you. Okay. A tremendous effort is required by both race. If their outlook, their manners, and the conduct are to reflect in their darkness, darkened age, the spirit and teachings of the phase of Baha'u'llah. Casting away once and for all, the fallacious palace, doctrine of racial superiority with all its attendant evils, confusion, and miseries, and welcoming and encouraging the intermixture of race and tearing down, tearing down the barriers that now divided them. They should each endeavor day and night to fulfill their particular responsibilities in their common task, which so urgently faces them. Let them, while each is attempting to contribute its share to the solution of this 
perplexing problem call to mind the warnings of Abdul Baha and visualize while there is yet time the dire consequence that must follow if this challenging and unhappy situation that face the entire American nations is not different, definitely reminded. Beautifully read. Thank you very much, dear Tesfa. Thank you. Okay. Now going to my dear friend, Dennis McGregor. And he's back. Dennis, you're up. Go for it. I'm psychic. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Good to have you. <laughs> okay. Let the white make a supreme effort in the resolve to contribute their share to the solution of this problem. To abandon once for all their usually inherent and at times subconscious sense of superiority to correct their tendency towards revealing a patronizing attitude towards the members of the other race, to persuade them through their intimate, spontaneous, and informal association with them of the genuineness of their friendship and the sincerity of their intentions, and to master the impatience of any lack of responsiveness on the part of a people who have received for so long a period such grievous and slow healing wounds let the Negroes, through a corresponding effort on their part, show by every means in their power the warmth of their response, their readiness to forget the past, their ability to wipe out every trace of suspicion that may still linger in their hearts and minds. Let neither think that the solution of so vast a problem is a matter that exclusively, exclusively concerns the other. Let neither think that such a problem can either easily or immediately be resolved. <clears throat> Carry on, dear Dennis. Let neither think that they can wait confidently for the solution of this problem until the initiative has been taken in the favorable circumstances created by agencies that stand outside the orbit of their faith. Let neither think that anything short of genuine love, extreme patience, true humility, consummate tact, sound initiative, mature wisdom, and deliberate, persistent, and prayerful effort, prayerful effort can succeed in blotting out the stain which this patent evil has left on the fair name of their common country. Let them rather believe and be firmly convinced that on their mutual understanding, their amity and sustained cooperation must depend more than on any other force or organization operating, operating outside the circle of their faith, the deflection of that dangerous course so greatly feared by the Baha and the materialization of the hopes he cherished for their joint contribution to the fulfillment of that country's glorious destiny. Excellent. Perfect. Wonderfully read, every one of you. So, these are the paragraphs 53 through 58 that encapsulate. Now here, the beloved guardian is really reaching out, going through one after another. We're just going to now just touch on these paragraphs as because we only have a few minutes before close of our session tonight, but I want to really hit home some messages uh, as we go through these paragraphs. So, dear friends, paragraph 53, wow, the beloved guardian is really saying in this paragraph that we, as he says, anyone, anyone, in this uh, first opening lines, the consciousness, if we come to this consciousness that this is our faith, that this is, says, says in the very purpose, the principles and ideals, once we have fully recognized the claim of its author, if we recognize this faith, then what? What does it say? 
we should accept unreservedly the principles and laws embodied in his teachings. Every differentiation of class, creed, or color must automatically be obliterated. We should immediately obliterate prejudice from ourselves. This is what it means. And never be allowed under any pretext, however great the pressure of events or of public opinion, to reassert itself. So we should keep watch of this, right? We should immediately eliminate prejudice within ourselves. This is what it says. If you accept His Holiness Baha'u'llah, then this is the first and foremost thing that you should do. Work to eliminate prejudice within yourselves and never allow it to reassert itself. If any discrimination is at all to be tolerated, what? This is incredible, dear friends. It should be a discrimination not against, but rather in favor of the minority, be it racial or otherwise. So what does it mean otherwise? For example, it could be positive discrimination for women. That's another, you know, because there might, they might be the minority, right? So if this is that we should be very cognizant and aware now, this is, we should, unlike the nations and peoples of the earth, be they the, the East or the West, democratic or authoritarian, communist or capitalist, whether belonging to the old world or the new, who either ignore, trample upon, or extirpate the racial, religious, or political minorities within the sphere of their jurisdiction. So the Baha'is should be different. We should be positively discriminating in favor of the minorities. This is what uh, his, the beloved guardian says. And this, my dear friends, is one of the key uh, lines in paragraph 53. Now, every organized community, and what are we, an organized community? Any assembly, any area, any group, any organized community, unlisted under the banner of Baha'u'llah. This is, should it feel it to be the what? First, an inescapable obligation to do what? Nurture, encourage, and safeguard every minority belonging to any faith, race, class, or nation within it. This should be the calling mark of what it means to be a Baha'i. This, and this is again, comes again and says, this is the, the standard of what it means to be a Baha'i. So then it talks about how in this uh, paragraph here, that it should be in all aspects of elections whether it's in our assemblies, our conventions, our conferences, it should be the duty, uh, in the middle of it, it says it should be the duty of every Baha'i community to arrange its affairs, that in cases where individuals belonging to diverse minority of elements are already qualified, so that we have this representation. Now, this is forward thinking, dear friends. This is the Baha'i thinking, that we should be thinking ahead like this, to arrange our affairs, to think with love. Mm -hmm. I love this, dear friends, and we should be having this. Do we have this currently? Mm -hmm. well, I, no. would say, I would say no, but should we have this? Absolutely. Yes. Right? <laughs> yes. So this is the standard, dear friends. Okay. Now. Sometimes we meet the standards. I don't know, my dear Don. I don't know. We're, we're work, it's, it's a work in progress. Now, th this is in paragraph 54. And why I read this one is because it is so powerful, so powerful as, as paragraph 53 is. Now, paragraph 54, freedom from racial prejudice in any of its forms should at such time as this when an increasingly large section of the human race is falling a victim to its devastating ferocity. And we read about that in paragraph 52, where the, the guardian is now calling upon uh, uh, humanity and saying, this is the most vital and challenging issue. He's saying it's falling a victim to this devastating ferocity. Be adopted as what? The watchword of the entire body of the American believers. So what is this watchword? Freedom from racial prejudice is the watchword, dear friends. The watchword of the entire body of the American believers is freedom from racial prejudice. So, and then what does the guardian say? This beloved guardian, he says, in whatever circle they move, whatever their age. So five-year-old, 
or the 80 year old, doesn't matter, whatever their age, freedom from racial prejudice is the watchword of the entire body of the American believers. They're, whatever circle they move, whatever the age, traditions, tastes, habits, then it goes on. He says it should be consistently demonstrated in every phase of their activity in life, whether in the Baha'i community or outside it, in public or in private, formally as well as informally, individually as well as in their official capacity. You get it, dear friends? Everywhere. This is pretty much what the beloved guardian is saying. It should be deliberately cultivated through the various and everyday opportunities, no matter how insignificant. Their homes, their business offices, their schools, their colleges, their social parties, their recreation grounds, their behind meetings, conferences, conventions, summer schools, and assemblies. I don't think he missed it anywhere, right? He's saying, <laughs> he's saying the watchword of the entire Baha'i body of American believers is freedom from racial prejudice. This is the most important issue, and this should be on our tongues, this should be on our lips. This should be in our private homes. This should be at work. And really, dear friends, we're at 8.30. And I think that's a great note to close on. And so next week, we're really going to explore these paragraphs. So I hope you enjoyed this session and brought a lot of fruitful thoughts to you. And, and you see, dear friends, how important is this topic and why the beloved guardian is truly stressing it because we see it in today's society as when the, uh, abdul baha is saying if we fail we see the blood in our streets and we are seeing it dear friends we are seeing it and the call is upon us to arise yes hey, we need we need to have a big vacuum to vacuum all this <laughs> I don't follow you, dear, uh, dear Tesfai. What do you mean by having a big vacuum? Uh, what do you mean Va by that? Vacuum to, to clean all this watch words and whatever you say about the racism. Oh, to From clean, to clean yeah, ourselves? To, to vacuum to absorb and the get material. rid of it. To get rid of it. Oh, to get rid of it. Oh, I see. Yeah, because saying. our vacuum is to be our holy writings. The Baha'u'llah's words. I That's see. our vacuum. I would, how nice would that be if we have a big vacuum to <laughs> suck up racism? That would be a nice, easy solution. You have okay. to put inside your heart. Miss Deborah, you had a hand, please. I just wanted to make a comment that, that he really stressed all races, all nationalities. It's the, the prejudice between the black and the white has been, uh, is so great, mm -hmm. but the white has has been uh, done so much damage towards the Native American Indians, the Japanese, especially after the uh, World War One or World War Two. I mean, and uh, the the Persians back in the in the eighties and such. There, there's just we have done so much damage, and look at what's happening to now the shootings that is going on. It's not just towards one, one race, it's going against all nationalities and all colors. Ms. And it's Deborah, being done by the white. Miss Deborah, not that that is not true. Absolutely, prejudice is all over the place and Groups have hurt each other and caused atrocities. But till the blacks and the whites come together, mm -hmm. there will be no peace. That's right. And this is very clear. And, you know, so this is something that um, the, the atrocities that whites have done to blacks for hundreds of years, mm -hmm. This is something that, dear friends, that, you know, in, in this section, in part, we just finished part 14, that I just very briefly touched on. And I, I know it was very powerful. And I, that section, I could have gone into far greater detail on the atrocities. And as dear Deborah, you're very correct. 
There were so many other accounts. What has happened in this country to Native Americans? What has happened in this country to Chinese Americans? What has this country has happened to Japanese Americans? But on a scale, dear friends, it is on a scale so much greater. And it's still happening, dear friends. Mm -hmm. It's still happening. The, the, the suffering in this country is still there. The pain has not gone away. And this is something that both have to come together. I, I, I go to dear Don, and then you will be our last hand of the evening. Okay, dear Don, and then we'll have closing prayer. Thank you so much. I would like to say a closing prayer, if I could, please. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, dear Don. So, so uh, dear friends, it's been a pleasure. Really, thank you to each one of you. So thank you, dear Don, and let's have our closing prayer. O my Lord and my hope, help thou thy loved ones to be steadfast in thy mighty covenant, to remain faithful to thy manifest cause, and to carry out the commandments thou didst set down for them in thy book of splendor, that they may become banners of guidance and lamps of the company above, wellsprings of thine infinite wisdom, and stars that lead aright as they shine down from the supernal sky. Verily thou art the invincible, the almighty, the all-powerful. Abdul Baha. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you very much, every one of you, and wishing you a wonderful evening and morning in India and all across the world. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much to every one of you. Thank and you, Asanjan. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night.